Good afternoon to everyone and welcome to today's webinar express. Why do most brands look great but sound terrible and what can you do about it? With our guest speaker Chris West and the event was organised by the CIM South East Group. If you are a university student attending today's webinar then you may want to sign up to the CIM Marketing Club. It will keep you up to date with the latest trends, innovations and concepts in the marketing industry. All you need to do is hover your camera over the QR code you can see on screen and that will take you through to the Marketing Club sign-up page. Next slide, Chris. So I would now like to, in, to introduce our guest speaker, Chris West. Chris is the CEO of Verbal Identity, widely considered one of the world's leading specialist consultancy in creating effective brand tone of voice. The business was formed 10 years ago and in that time has worked with the leaders of businesses as diverse as Alphabet's Moonshot Factory in Silicon Valley, LVMH spin-offs from General Motors, national brands here in the UK including Mulberry, John Lewis, Talk Talk and Vauxhall, as well as startups in fintech, data science and beauty. Chris's book, Strong Language, detailing how you can build an effective differentiated brand tone of voice, reached number one on Amazon just 36 hours after it was launched. So if you're ready, Chris, it's over to you. So CIM, a lot of respect for CIM. I have been watching from afar CIM for a number of years and been delighted what they're doing, delighted how they're building such an engaged community. Thank you very much for your time. I'm going to speak for about 30 minutes and then uh, some questions at the end, which you're going to ask me, I hope. Now, uh, there's a poll in the middle and uh, I think there should be a bylaw against PowerPoints with just tons of information because if that was the point of a PowerPoint or a presentation deck, then you could just send a PDF. What I want to do is show you some things, talk about some things, and get you to think, and then maybe you can ask me some questions at the end. So the subtitle for this is Faster, Smarter, Cheaper because we all have to write every day. Air look around you in your company, and if it's not lunchtime, then what is everyone doing? Generally, what everyone is doing is either writing because they've got one of these things a uh, keyboard or they're reading an email or a report or something else that someone else has written so all the time we seem to wherever we are in our business and it's we'll come to this in a minute all the different places language is working but it seems like language is a fundamental thing that we all need to have um, so wouldn't it be nice if we could write faster smarter and cheaper i just want to check in with everyone before we start though it's lunchtime and i just want to ask you how many of you are now, like me, what I would call a dairy dodger? So I've given up dairy for various reasons. A little bit of health, a little bit of some other th thoughts around dairy. So when you have your um, cup of coffee after lunch today or a cup of tea after lunch today, do you have it black or do you have it white? And if you have it white, do you have it with dairy or do you have it with, a, with one of these dairy alternatives? Why is that important? Well, because... I want to explain to you why I think language is probably one of the most valuable things that you can get hold of in your company. And what happens when you don't go down the route that everyone else has gone down, which seems to be just creating the same old, same old kind of language. When, you're, when your brand and your business looks great, why aren't you going down the route of creating language which really stands out? So back to this after lunch coffee that you're going to have. If you're a dairy dodger like me, you will possibly have oat milk in your coffee. And there are two brands out there. I think the earlier brand onto the market was Root Health. And Root Health said, well, you know, it's about a healthier lifestyle. That's why you drink oat milk. And so a healthier lifestyle is, you know, doing yoga and climbing trees, da, 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 whatever, yeah. Then Oatly came onto the scene and Oatly said, why should you drink oat milk? Because the dairy industry is destroying the planet. The dairy industry is destroying the climate. You look at the emissions that, from the dairy industry and you see the damage it's doing. So on the one hand, we had a brilliantly uh, valued company, Root Health, they were valued at 70 million, I believe. And they, and this is where we're going to come to the poll in about 30 seconds. Talking about what you might expect, they were valued at 70 million. And then Oatly came along and they 
use language to talk about something else. But before we start doing the poll and ask you what do you think Oatly was valued at, let's just take a step back. Oat milk is really oats in water. And if it's oats in water, you're not going to expect to notice a lot of difference between root health oat milk and Oatly oat milk. They're both very good, I would say. And, you know, I've tried both. And for me, for my palate, I can't tell the difference. And I've actually done a blind tasting and I can't tell the difference. So oats in water versus oats in water. Well, they're going to taste the same. Not only do they taste the same, but if you look, they're packaged the same. Then these Tetra Packs, not just tasting the same, packaged the same, they're distributed through the same channels, pretty much. So if I go into my local supermarket, reach into the chiller cabinet, there I'm going to find root health shoulder to shoulder with Oatly. So they taste the same, they're distributed in the, in the same channels and they have the same packaging. One is valued at 70 million, talking about uh, you know, health is uh, yoga and climbing trees. And the other one said, no, hold on. We can use language to create a difference. And the language that they were using was talking about the impact of the dairy industry on the climate. And actually, this was a much bigger thing to do. So here's the poll. And the CIA, at least in the CIM team, are going to run the poll for us now. But what would you think? Root Health, an established brand, was valued at 70 million. Along comes this challenger, Oatly, says, no, it's not, oat milk isn't about health. It used language to say it was about something different. Do you think it would be valued in tens of millions? Do you think it would be, Oatly would be valued in hundreds of millions? Do you think perhaps Oatly might be valued, oh, let's, let's be ridiculous, at a billion. Okay. Looks like most people were going for around about 100 million. Fair enough. The actual answer was 13 billion. So somehow, oats and water tasting the same, packaged the same way, distributed through the same channel, somehow, Oatly managed to create a huge valuation for their business. And I want to say it's dropped down $6 billion, like, Six billion is still a huge valuation for oats and milk in the same packaging distributed through the same channel. And I am a sucker for art direction. I love brands that are well art directed. So I will acknowledge that I like the art direction on Oatly a little bit more than I like Root Health. But it is the language that is making the difference. It is the language which is compelling people to pick up Oatly in the first place. So, and I haven't seen any advertising. It's not like they spent more on advertising. It's the language and particularly language on the pack, some on the advertising, this may want to pick it up. It's language that, because I feel, it's the language that's made me feel great about choosing Oatly and doing something for the planet, rather than doing yoga for myself. And it's Oatly really, it's, sorry, it's language really that has helped position Oatly to this $13 billion, six to $13 billion valuation compared to a 70 million valuation. It is language which has built that. And that, I think, is the really interesting thing, that language wins customers, because that's what Oatly did. They built the market and they pulled those customers into this market with language. It, language wins customers faster. It deepens loyalty because we love sharing stories. So language shared, uh, sorry, so Oatly shared a story through language and they built loyalty. And they did that in a really smart way, not with loyalty cards or giving away anything else, just with language. And they depositioned rivals to build this huge valuation. So that's why I think language is off, is off should never be overlooked, because it's language which wins customers faster, deepens loyalty smarter, and depositions rivals. And that's the work that we've been doing. Phil was kind enough to mention my book, which launched uh, just at the end of last year, Strong Language, which went to number one. Uh, I am... Back in my early days, a copywriter in advertising, so that's where my love, that's one of the places where my love of language came from. I've been recognised by DNAD. Uh, I've talked to business schools around the world, including NYU uh, Stern in, in New York, and also wrote a short film that won uh, Best Film Barcelona Film Festival. Delighted to work with clients who are switching on to the power of language. So the question that's coming up is why is brand tone of voice critical again? 
And I think that's a really good question to consider, just briefly. You and I know there are more channels that our brands have to communicate in than ever before. That's fair enough. But there are more challenges than ever before. And when you don't have a lot of resources as a challenger, one of the things you are going to rely on is language. So if you're a challenger, that's great. You can start telling a challenging story. If you're an incumbent and a market dominant brand, then you need to start using language to lock off the avenues that the challengers can use. What we're also seeing through Black Lives Matter, through COVID, through a number of other things is that consumers no longer want to be the recipient of a monologue from a brand in all these channels. They actually want to be asking brands, what's your view on this? And if you don't have a voice, you can't share your view. Most brands are fighting to win attention through performance marketing and they're spending a lot of money. But what happens when you win attention? If that's the first step, you actually want to engage people. And there's this other expectation that brands are always on. So now we can see that language is working everywhere, and I'll come to a little bit about that in a second. It's working everywhere. It's working all the time. And it's working with a greater velocity. In my early days, you know, a brand director could brief a team and review the work this week or next week. Now you've got 100 tweets going out today. We did a back of an envelope calculation and found that the average, that, that, that the um, CMO of even a medium-sized brand is responsible for producing more words tomorrow than the ed editor of The Guardian puts into the newspaper. That's not just advertising. It's all these other places where language is working. Customer service, when the CEO stands up to give a presentation. How do people in your business talk about the brand? How do you talk to the board about the brand? What's on the pack? When you have influencers talking about your brand, how do they talk about the brand? All of these things, language is working everywhere all the time with a greater velocity. And so we were talking to the CMO of BMW in Germany recently, and he made the point that absolutely no way would he allow his logo or any other aspect of his brand's visual identity to go out looking like this. Yet so many brand owners, because they don't feel they have the way to control language, are effectively doing this with their brand language. So the question really is, how can you make your brand tone of voice as consistent as your other brand elements, but how can you also make it flexible? Because we know that social media is one of the channels, but it's a different environment to advertising, which is different environment to the CEO standing up and giving a quarterly report to the city or even an investor uh, relations chat, or even talking to your team about what business is doing. All of these different places language is working. It needs to sound like you as a business, as one brand talking, but you need to be flexible in these different channels. How can you do that? Well, there's a framework I'm about to share with you. And it, I'm gonna ask you to think about something for 30 seconds and then you know raise a hand virtually, even if we're not gonna see you raise a hand. But um, let's look at Mini and Ferrari. I mean, if a Ferrari drove past my office now, you'd be pretty sure if you heard the car engine that that was a Ferrari and then going the other way, that's probably a Mini. So, you know, just by the sound of them, you can notice a difference. And certainly both brands spend a lot of time engineering the sound of their cars. Visually, they're both red. Yeah, okay. Well done, Chris, pointing that out. But the one on the right is clearly a Ferrari. Straight away you can see that's a Ferrari and pretty quickly on the left you can recognize that as a Mini. And even from say 500 meters down the road you'd know that's a Ferrari, that's a Mini. So their visual identity, their oral, you know, the sound of them is very carefully controlled. So do you, question for you, do you think that the brand owners of Mini and Ferrari can, add, can make their brand voice as differentiated? So you know that's Mini and that's Ferrari. Well, there's a way to test this. I'm gonna show you now two pieces of copy. One is from Ferrari, one is from Mini. In both cases, the brands are talking about how their car takes a corner. Now, normally you would see this with, you know, font and color palette and photography and all the other elements of, of the visual identity but I've taken all those away and presented it in the most straightforward font I can do. 
So I'm going to ask you two pieces of copy. One is from Mini, one is from Ferrari. Which is which? One of those is from Mini, one of those is from Ferrari. There's no indication from the visual identity. So did you think that Ferrari was the copy on the left? Put your hand up in the virtual world. I can't see you. Uh, did you think that Mini was the brand on the left? I reckon all of us have put our hand up to say, yep, brand X, the copy on the left is Mini. How on earth can we know that? There's no other visual clues. It's just from the words and the language and the way the language is constructed. That's brilliant. Somehow, Mini and Ferrari have, met, have managed to make their language as distinctive, as identifiable, as supportive and creative of the brand identity is just as any of the other elements. And that's what I hope we would all want to do as well. So what's going on here? Sorry, you might have said, well, born to corner or ton of fun, fun or high curves, high curves. That's um, definitely, that's definitely going to be a Ferrari thing. Ton of fun, that's definitely going to be a mini thing. So what is it? Well, when we take a step back, we realize there are actually kind of three things going on in all brand language. And when you pay attention to those three things, that's what makes your brand language differentiated, it's what makes it consistent, and it's what makes it flexible as well. So when you read the copy on the left, it feels to me like these are a fun bunch of people. And they, as far as they're concerned, Driving should be fun. You should get out of the car smiling. And probably what they, you know, what they don't believe in is, you know, kind of being too pompous about it. Now, Ferrari on the right, you know, as far as they're concerned, driving, you know, to the shops or whatever for a weekend, that should be like an F1 experience, kind of highly technical. So they're really standing for technical and uh, and they're standing against probably the fun, flippant thing attitude that a lot of people bring to their cars. So there's a kind of worldview behind what they're talking about, even though they haven't said we're exclusive and F1 and, or we just think it's a laugh in Mini's case. So there's that, there's that worldview. But then there's tonal values in the language itself. So fun, you know, Mini is trying to make it about a lot of fun. That language on the right with Fry is very technical. It's almost engineering as well very complicated. Language on the left, simple, straightforward. So there's another level, there's those tonal values. And then, but neither of those two things are actually things you could specifically point to on the page. And then there are other things which you can point to on the page. The nuts and bolts, if you like, there's a specific word. So ton of fun or fun, you know, that's not a word that you're going to see appearing in Ferrari's copy. Go-kart handling is another expression. And in fact, this key expression Mini likes so much that if you go and look at the Twitter bio of Mini for Spain, Mini Spain, on the Twitter bio there, it says El Casa de Go-Kart Handling. So, you know, they've identified that this is a key expression for them, but even their sentences are shorter. So that first sentence, three words, I don't think there's a sentence short in about 15, 20 words on Ferrari's copy. And my old grammar teacher at school, he would say, like English teacher at school, he'd say, born to corner, that's not real grammar, Chris. Right? There's no, you know, there's no noun, verb, or all of that stuff. You know, there's no do a verb, do it, whatever, right? It's not proper grammar. Well, it's modern grammar. So many on this kind of ground level nuts and bolts, they've chosen also to adapt their grammar. And Ferrari have chosen their sentence length and their technicality and things like that. So over the last 10 years that we've been doing this. We've built this framework, which identifies really that if you want to make the brand voice consistent and true to who you are, but also flexible, you need to identify and define these three layers, these three levels of the brand voice. The 10,000 foot overarching narrative, once, once you define that for everyone writing on your brand, they'll know what to talk about and the angle they can take on it. When you come down to uh, 1,000 feet, then what you're talking about there really is what you're using there rather are the tonal values. What personality do you want to create? Kind of quite severe engineering, technical expertise, aloof, maybe elitist or fun, easygoing, 
relax people. And then the nuts and bolts. Do you use the ground level? Do you use jargon? Do you not use jargon? Get clear on your grammar choices. Get clear on other things like sentence length. It's amazing how, much, how, many, how many hours of meetings you can uh, remove once you've agreed on those ground level details. And once you put all of those together, it's not just about the brand language we found, it actually unleashes a lot of creativity. So that's the 10,000 foot, 1,000 foot ground level details. And that's what Oatly did so well to produce such a huge valuation. And just as an example of that uh, 10,000 foot kind of quite controversial narrative, um, you can see to Tony's Chocolone, if you don't know the brand, I'd say please look out for it, please hunt it down. And Brewdog, which a lot of people know. Very controversial, very kind of change orientated, very challenger in their mindset. And so is Dash, a soft water drink. But just because you've def just because you're kind of controversial or rocking the boat at the 10,000 foot world view level doesn't mean that when you come down to 1,000 foot, you have to be aggressive like that. Definitely Brewdog is aggressive. Tony's Chocolate Lonely is confrontational in the nice of Dash has the same view as Oatly, believes that, you know, agriculture is in danger of damaging the climate. But when you come down to their 1,000 foot level, the personality they've created, talking about wonky fruit misshapen, is much more conciliatory. So identifying those three levels and knowing where you can go at each level is a critical thing. I'm going to jump over this. I'm going to jump over Uber as well, because it's just really to illustrate the point that how they've changed at different levels of their voice. So the question is, how good can you make your guidelines? If you're sitting on guidelines for your brand voice, which say human friendly, warm and approachable, I would say, well done, you've started. But unfortunately, probably what your writers hear is blah, 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 blah. Because every brand wants to be human friendly, warm and approachable. I mean, which brand in a way wants to be inhuman, hostile, cold and distant? And if it's ridiculous to say the opposite of those values, it must be equally obvious and kind of mm, same as everyone else to say those values themselves. So if you've defined your brand voice with four tonal values on a page, I would actually say, well done, you have done more than 50% of the rest of the world who's hoping that the writers will just do it or they're having another meeting where they're saying it's not quite us, I don't know, have another go or whatever. Or they're investing all their money in one writer and desperately hoping that they never go away on holiday or get ill. But how good can you make your brand, brand voice guidelines? Three, four years ago, MailChimp were very good at um, uh, you know, publishing freely their brand voice guidelines, and they were pretty good. And if you want more examples of brand voice guidelines, please get in touch with me. Very happy to do that. Uh, they were three or four or five pages. But I think if you can define your brand if voice guidelines using this framework, it's not only doing the job you need it to, not only showing you consistency and flexibility, not only kind of mapping out what you can write and what you, you know, the angle that you can take on things that you're writing and the personality and removing all these hours. I think if you build guidelines based on this, you can actually get into quite a lot of detail for your brand and your brand voice. And actually, why is that a great idea? Because it means that when a new writer starts on Monday, by about Monday, four o'clock, they're already using the brand voice and they're often running in it instead of a month late and six meetings and they're disappointed because they're smart and they're being well paid and they don't get it. And someone says, oh, I don't know, maybe we should let them go or something terrible like that. Or you're sitting there at 10 o'clock at night, write it, surprising that copy gets written at 10 o'clock at night, I found. If you've got really good comprehensive guidelines, then actually you're in a great place because you spent the time, you've dug the foundations, you've aligned everyone with it, you've not going to get calls from the board saying, why have you said this? Because it's really clear in your guidelines. This is an example of guidelines we built for a car brand. We talked about the narrative, the tone of voice, we talked about the ground level details, but we went into a visual representation of voices positioning. We gave lots of examples of the voice in action with writers' tips. We even defined humour. What kind of humour would they use? So just coming to the end now, I did say smart, fast, cheaper writing. Here are some tips. 
This is a you know, beautifully produced uh, version of Like a Rolling Stone by Bob Dylan, beautiful artwork. We all want to create absolutely the perfect thing the first time we sit down and write. Here's what it looked like when Bob Dylan started writing it, okay? All I want to say there is if you want to write faster and smarter, encourage version not point crap. This was advice given to me, excuse me if you, if you think that's rude for me to say. This was advice that was given to me by, um, when we did some work with Alphabet. They said, look, every time we produce anything from this business, it's not gonna be right. And actually the biggest determinant of the final quality of the product, or the writing in this case, is how soon we start and how quickly we just get that first terrible version out. Because as soon as we've got that out, then we're rolling and then we can make it better. It's never perfect first time. Version not point crap is always the first version. So encourage that. Read it aloud. Did I miss one? No, I, I'm sorry, I missed a tip. Maybe that's, uh, maybe that's an encouragement for you to get in contact with me and say, Chris, what was writer's tip number two? Next brilliant piece of advice is when you've written something, just spend some time, read it aloud. Because if you read it aloud, absolutely guaranteed that if it sounds wrong when you say it, it will read wrong and confuse people when they read it. Oh, there's writer's tip number two. Who, who would have thought it? Write, that, write like they're walking away. Brilliant piece of advice that was given to me, which is most people don't have time or interest, inclination to, to read what you've written. So when they pick something up to read, they're already mentally walking away. So don't wait for paragraph two or three or four to say what it is you have to say. Say it in the first sentence. Put your position right up front. See if you can catch them before they mentally or physically walk away. So write like they're walking away. A little writer's tip from, from the people in the newspapers, editors have got this habit of when an article is being proposed, when an article is written and submitted to them, they'll cross out the first paragraph and start reading from the second paragraph. If it makes sense reading straight from the go at the second paragraph, choices are the first paragraph wasn't necessary, so they'll chuck it away. They'll cross through the second paragraph. Does it make sense reading straight from the third paragraph? If not, then you need that second paragraph to keep it in as, as where you start. If it still makes sense reading from the get-go from the third paragraph, cross out the second paragraph. Write like they're walk already walking away. How can you write faster? Throw up on your typewriter in the morning, clean up in the afternoon. In the back of my head, I think this is an Ernest Hemingway quote, but I very much doubt it. Um, I think it's probably my association with his boozing lifestyle. I don't literally mean throw up in the morning, clean up in the afternoon, but it's another good editorial piece of advice, which is don't worry, turn off the internal editor, just get out there and write. And then this afternoon, or even better, tomorrow, come back and then have a look at it and just see what you needed to do. Okay, final thing, just the power of language. If you were given 10 million, 100 million pounds, 10 million pounds, and a year to make your, uh, you were the brand director of an airport, second airport in Chicago, uh, and you wanted to make it famous, what would you do? You'd have all the different kinds of options, you know, advertising, uh, greeters, anything else. If you had a thousand pounds and one week, and you still needed to get everyone in the world to know that your airport was friendlier and more welcoming than anyone else, what could you do? You could use language, and that's exactly what Mitchell Airport did in Chicago. They put up this wonderful sign after you have had to take your belt off your trousers, wonder where your phone is, wonder where the rest of your party are, had to pack everything up, et cetera, et cetera, and they labeled this area the recombobulation area. Not after you, fe after you felt so discombobulated, you got to be recombobulated, and this has shown up again and again in people's social media feeds around the world. And that's what language does. It is faster, smarter, cheaper than any other brand, lever tool, anything you've got. Okay, that's it for me. If you uh, want to reach out to me, I would love to talk to you. I spend too much time, I admit, on LinkedIn and you can find Chris West, that's me, on LinkedIn if you look for Chris West Verbal Identity. If you want to email me, it's chris at verbalidentity.com. Thank you all so much for your time, and I will hand back now to Phil. Phil, I think that's 35 minutes, and maybe there are some questions around what you do with your language, 
where does language work? How long does it take? You know, one of the most important things, or even um, talk about some of those writers' tips. Phil, over to you. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Okay, thanks very much uh, for that, Chris. Um, as Chris has said, we're now going to have a quick uh, Q and A session. Okay, Chris, I'm going to dive straight in with question number one. It's a good place to start. Um, okay. Do you have any examples of guidelines built on the three principles? Uh, yes, I do, and uh, I could share. I mean, I think we shared some of them there already. Well, sorry, I shared one that was for a UK car brand and that were perhaps a little bit more detailed than the question I was asking for because there I was showing all four I was showing kind of all 14 sections of the guidelines um, part of the issue is obviously that it's wrapped up in client confidentiality yeah. I don't have anything that I can share at the moment but as a fun exercise we could you know if someone wanted to we could look at kind of backward engineering what Mini's three levels would be and what Ferrari's three levels would be and, and kind of build them out that way. Okay, are there any um, are there any sort of useful resources on your website that people can sort of tap into? Yes, presumably? yes, there will be. Uh, so yes, if you go to Verbal, thank you, Phil. If you go to verbalidentity.com, you'll find some resources, quite a few, I think. Uh, I don't wish to I don't wish to push the book unnecessarily. But a lot of the framework is talked about in the book. So, um, I mean, have a look at the book. It's probably the best best way of doing it. And I think it's quite cheap on Amazon. Okay. Um, still on the subject of guidelines. So, creating guidelines is a mammoth task. Sorry, those questions are leaping around. Yeah. Creating guidelines is a mammoth task. What's the best way to tackle it? And how long should it? take to achieve a reasonable meaningful document I, well I, I mean I think that's a really interesting question it sounds like someone's been a little bit uh, burnt maybe or, or bruised by the process of creating guidelines I, it hasn't been a mammoth task for us in the past I remember when we worked with the car brand whose guidelines I did show you we managed we produced those in around about three months right from the kind of first meeting to the all signed off by the board and getting the writers starting to get the writers trained and I think that was about a year faster than that car brand was managing with their visual identity guidelines so I would say I would want you to think of it as a mammoth task and at its longest three months four months I would say for the for the verbal identity guidelines and it can be even quicker. We're working with a startup at the moment, and they don't have a lot of people in their business. So producing heavily elaborate guidelines would be entirely the wrong thing for them. So it's a much shorter set of guidelines, maybe eight to 12 pages, and we're doing that in probably at half the time. So I think there's two things wrapped up in the answer. One is make sure you're choosing the right guidelines for your business that will actually make an impact, practical impact on your business. And secondly, um, you know, even if you're a large business, you know, we work with huge businesses, even if you're a large business, I don't think it has to be paid. It's certainly not, not painful and it doesn't have to be a mammoth long task. You know, you can expect in three months to have what you want, hopefully. Okay. Um... Are there any specific tips for B2B versus B2C content? Well, I want to be a little bit provocative here and say, why Why would there be? Why should there be? I know when I started advertising uh, 25 years ago as a copywriter, and I've done a lot of things since then. So, you know, there was, um, well, there was all, already at that stage a kind of quite a lot of thinking saying that, you know, B to people buying in B to B do buy through a different process, but they're still humans buying, and they're still, you know, have an emotional component to them. So I think that we don't need to relegate or reconsider B to B as a separate category to B to C. Certainly not in the production of the guidelines. You might make, you probably would make different choices in the way that in the kind of channels or 
different approaches to communication, but certainly the way you construct the voice, I don't think it's important. We have a process that's worked, as well as the framework, we have a process that's worked for B2B, B2C, uh, you know, kind of multinationals and two-person startups. And the process is really around co-creating with the, with the brand team, because they're the people that intuitively and explicitly know the brand best. And working with them is, is really critical. So in our process, we typically develop or work with them. They develop three territories, broad territories. We're able to kind of finesse and polish those so there's uh, and then they can pick one and then we develop that and we would use exactly the same process b2b as b2c so. right. okay great thanks chris um this next question um maybe a, a, a cry from the heart here um have you got any <laughs> tips for overcoming writer's block uh yeah i do and uh, yeah it does sound like it's coming from the heart i mean i would that thing of version not my version not my crap get it out uh, have a buddy, um, whether that's an accountability buddy or an editing buddy, have that person so that I know I've got to write uh, something and it might be overdue if I don't do it soon. So there's a great guy called Mike, who's my accountability partner. I know he's going to call me and say, have you done it? If you haven't done it, you know, what do you need to do to put aside to make sure that you've got time to do it? And da -da -da. So an accountability partner is great. An editing partner, if you don't have someone that can look at it, then leave it for as long as you can, preferably overnight. Um, but there's really nothing that beats uh, just encouraging and accepting a version not point crap because um, you know that's the first version of everything is terrible and waiting for inspiration. I mean, I would wait for the rest of my days to feel inspired. You just have to sit down and write. Give it a go, I guess. Um, what are your top tips for getting all colleagues on board, many of who are adamant that they don't need to be told how to write? <laughs> well, I suppose it depends on the level of seniority of their colleagues that don't need to be told how to write. Uh, again, I don't want to push the book, but I'm doing that because it's I'm, forget, I'm forgetting one of the critical chapters in there at the moment. But in there, there is a section on how to bring others on board and you can do a simple questionnaire you know you can say how well do you think our brand voice matches our overall positioning and then get as many people to fill in that questionnaire as possible there's a bit more detail on how to do that and what questions to ask in the book um what else i think just yeah. And the other great way of doing it is to do what we did with Mini and Ferrari, which is to take something that a few things that have been written, completely strip them of any visual identity cues, lay them out on the long boardroom table and just say, which is us? You know, hide the brand name or the product specifics and say, which is us? You know, here's 12 uh investor relations chat here are six customer service letters from six different brands here are you know four different pieces of website copy about us pages from four different brands here's this here's that which are us and if you know the people you're showing it to can't say that's us that's us that's us that's us then what are you doing spending the money writing that stuff and putting it out there if it doesn't in some way propel your brand forward build your brand equity you know, shout who you are as a brand and what you believe in and everything you're trying to do. So I would say those are a couple of ways, kind of getting, looking first of all for a wider consensus, but secondly, also looking to just de-identify and then uh, different pieces of written work and then see if you can get people to spot, which is us. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Chris. Um, we've got time, I think, probably for a couple more questions. Uh, I know we're running slightly over, but um, and I'm just going to sort of paraphrase the number of questions that come through on on the sort of theme. Yes, yeah. If you, if, you, if, you, if you work for an organisation that has, you know, multiple brands or different products and services in different markets with different audiences, how do you maintain that consistency of tone of voice across? Or in fact, how do you identify what the tone of voice should be 
in the first instance. Um, you know, is it one persona or is it different personas? I guess the supplementary question is, you know, if you've got if you're if you've got global markets, obviously you've got audiences that speak different languages. How do you cope with that? Well, I think that I'll answer the second question, the second part of that question first, if I may. The the great thing about this framework is what you're once you've specified it, the actual amount of trans creation is really minimized. It's really minimized. But if you think that uh, for a brand, if you're talking to a team in Peru, they don't need to, if you've defined your guidelines here on those three levels, they don't need to say, who are we? What do we stand for? What's the world we're trying to create? What do we stand for? What do we stand against? And therefore, what can we write about? And what's the angle we can take on different things we write about? That's already defined. That doesn't change. And the personality, you want someone landing, uh, walking off the plane in Lima to have the same experience of your brand as they did when they were wherever they started their journey from. So the personality shouldn't change. It may be just down at the ground level, but even not all of that is changing very much. You don't need to change the jar, you know, your agreements on jargon and whether you have very formalized grammar or more kind of modern grammar. Actually, really all you're doing is changing the lexicon, the words and phrases you use and don't use. So defining the voice in those three ways really helps. That was the first part of that question, Phil, wasn't that? Sorry, I've forgotten what it was. Yeah, it's where if you work for an organization that has multiple yeah. brands. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, if they're different brands, they stand, I mean, if they're literally different brands, different badged brands, they stand for something different. And so therefore you can imagine that the tone of voice is different. If they're different brands coming out of one identifiable place, what you might find is that a lot of work we've done at this top level, this uh, overarching narrative, this worldview, what we stand for, what we believe in, um, that will be largely similar from one brand to the next. Um, and it may be some of the personality is overlapping, and it may be just at the ground level that you're doing a lot of changes. Uh, we're working, or we've been talking to a uh, kind of house of brands, and they've identified that they need a tone of voice for each of their different brands because they're approaching a different part of the set, uh, market, but they also need a brand tone of voice overarching for the parent brand as well. But it's definitely doable, and it's definitely worth doing. I mean, it's the same question, really. Would you send them out with the same, exactly the same art direction? No, you would change some things, but you would make sure they're seen as sibling brands. So it's a, it's a pretty similar process, yeah. Okay, great, thanks. Um, and finally, uh, Chris, uh, again, a number of people asked this sort of question. What kind of research do you suggest to understand pillars of the brand that you've been talking about? Where would you start? What kind of research would you do to understand what's going on in your market? Was that the question, Phil? No, uh, to understand the pillars of the brand that you've been talking about. So. Oh, okay. Well, I mean, it feels like all I'm here to do is kind of mention the book Strong Language again, and I'm sorry about that. But, uh, you know, in a 45-minute in a seminar, perhaps we're getting quite a lot of the sense, but not everything. But back in the book, there is a research methodology for how do you identify the different pillars of the brand, and some of that overlaps into classic brand uh, brand positioning work. Some of that is particularly suited just for language. And really, our personal view is you can do this outside in or inside out. Outside in is you say, well, you know, what's the market doing? Where's the hole in the market? How are we going to fill that hole? Or you can do it inside out and say, look, there's something really good about this brand, and it is, man it, you know, it is, it is walked around the building inside the heads of all of us. So actually, if we want to know what's best about this brand, we need to somehow get it out of the heads of key people in this business. So there's a bit of a skill in choosing which people you ask to share that information and how you get it out of them. But with some subtle questioning, you can start to do that. And in the book, again, sorry, in the book, strong language, there is quite a lot of detail then on how you can build up these do exactly that process of how you can build up these different pillars combine everyone's information together in a really useful way so you've got a strong strong sense of these are the three or four things that are particularly us okay great uh, thanks very much chris we've definitely run out of time for our questions now but thank you very much to everybody who submit questions and apologies if we haven't got around to yours uh,
that today. Again, thank you to Chris for your excellent presentation and to the CIM Southeast Group for organising the event. We do hope you have enjoyed the session and you found it interesting and worthwhile. Um, we'll be back with our next webinar express called Imposter Syndrome, How to Beat It with Caroline Donaldson on Tuesday the 10th of May, again at our usual time of 1pm. You'll find further details about the webinar listed on the events page of the CIM website where you'll also be able to register for the session. Just leaves me to thank Chris once again for a fantastic presentation and to say thank, thank you, you so much. Yeah, thank you, Chris. And a thank you for joining us today. We take care, everybody. Uh, we look forward to welcoming you again to our webinars in the future. Goodbye.